Hey everyone, and welcome back to another post from r slash ask reddit, a subreddit where anyone can ask a question, and the most popular questions and answers get upvoted to the top. Today's question is for doctors of reddit. What was your how the f did you survive that moment? Not a doctor, but I'm a firefighter, so I see my fair share of trauma. About a year ago, we responded to a call that went out as an individual who had a car fall on his face. He was hotboxing in his garage while working underneath his car that was supported by scissor jacks. Something to note, the car didn't have any tires on the front end where he was working. One of the scissor jacks had slipped out from underneath the car, and the whole weight of the car landed directly onto the side of his head with no tires to stop the fall. We got our rubber airbags out, lifted the car, pulled him out, and got him onto a stretcher. After taking 2,500 pounds of weight to the head, he somehow got out of it with a fractured orbital and a laceration on his cheek. First year of my core surgical training, I was on call in a very small rural hospital. This hospital only had two doctors on at night, me and a medical trainee, and no emergency doctors. It's about 11 p.m. and this guy, 26, comes in after being in a fight. Blood is pumping from his nose, which was clearly fractured. I suspected he probably had other facial fractures underneath, but he was awake and talking to me. Otherwise, he seemed fine. I spent about 45 minutes trying to stop the blood, using all sorts of nose packs, pressure, even tried a catheter balloon to try and tamponade it. Nothing was working, and he was starting to go into shock. And I was basically shitting myself at this stage. Based on his vitals, I'd estimated he lost almost 1.5 liters of blood so far. Nearest proper surgical hospital was 45 minutes away, and my consultant was at home, 25 minutes from the hospital. I was a surgical resident in a small town hospital. We got paged to see a patient for a speared piece of driftwood through the leg. We were thinking it was nicked femoral artery, and we were discussing if this poor kid needed amputation. But when we saw him, he was standing on the skewered leg taking a piss. Turns out the wood missed every single one of the vital vessels and no fracture, just muscular damage. I'm a junior doc on the trauma team. Doors to rhesus fly open to reveal a man carrying a second blood soaked man in his arms. We get him onto a stretcher and it is clear he has a gunshot wound to his chest and has gone into cardiac arrest. Chest compressions start and with minutes, the a and &E consultant is performing an open thoracotomy in order to start cardiac massage. Cardiothoraxes join us quickly and get to work on the heart. A hole in the right ventricle is identified and plugged with a Foley catheter. All the while, bag after bag of O negative is being pushed into the patient in an attempt to replace everything that had pumped out of his heart and into his thoracic cavity. 15 to 20 minutes into this, the impossible happens. We get ROSC. The heart starts beating on its own. Patient is taken directly to theater where the hole is definitely repaired and bilateral chest trains are inserted to drain the blood filling his lungs. Somehow, his heart continued beating and after a couple of weeks in ICU, the patient is returned to the trauma ward awake and alert. Several weeks, some mild hypoxic brain injury and gnarly chest scar later, he walks off the ward with his dad, the man who carried him in. ETA definition of ROSC, which is return of spontaneous circulation for those wondering. Every time I think of this question, the answer is usually meth. One guy got hit in the face hard enough to let air into his brain cavity and was being an absolute arsehole, which seemed to be normal for him, and literally asked, got any meth? When I offered some pain relief. To my understanding, he recovered without any need for surgery. I'm an emergency nurse. Once I had a guy come in who had been cutting a tree with a chainsaw when it hit a knot in the wood and kicked up into his neck. 
He finished cutting the tree because he knew his wife would make him get rid of the chainsaw, put a towel on it, and drove himself to the hospital. CT showed no vascular damage, simple washout, and home the next day. One of the paramedics who saw him said to his patient, That's a real emergency! Why don't we ever get those? I had a neighbor that was in the logging business. He was working alone, stupid, and wasn't wearing chaps. The chainsaw kicked back and went into his thigh, barely missing his femoral artery. When he jerked it away from his leg, he hit the tree and somehow broke the chain, which then wrapped itself around his face and neck. Mainly superficial damage there. He tied his leg off and drove himself to the nearest hospital that was over 50 miles away. This was in the 80s, so no cell phones. Just ended up with some gnarly scars. I was working in the emergency department when a toddler came in after falling out of a three-story window, completely unharmed. The sad thing was, they were from a rough neighborhood and the mom hadn't even noticed for about a half an hour. Apparently, the friendly apartment pot smokers found him, checked him over, and sat with him for a half an hour, and when mom didn't show up, they went to find her. The child was admitted overnight, mostly for social reasons, but it's just amazing how well kids bounce. I'm not a doctor yet, but I worked in a trauma center as a scribe before starting med school. Basically, I was attached at the hip with a doctor to do their documentation. One guy wrecked his car into a wooden fence, and a wooden fence post went into his mouth and came out the back of his neck. It was the kind of fence post that was a double size of his mouth. It had basically pushed all of the important anatomy to the side as it impaled him. They were consulting doctors for like 10 different specialties working on this guy in the hospital. Several weeks later, after he fully recovered, he walked back in the emergency department to thank everyone. I had a patient that attempted suicide with an AR-15 under the chin, put a hole in the soft tissues of the floor of his mouth and his tongue in his hard palate, and then split the hemispheres of his brain perfectly, finally popping out the top of his skull. He recovered fully. Not a doctor, but a paramedic. Once, I went to a car wreck where a drunk driver drove head first into the corner of a brick bridge at 100 miles per hour, took a huge wedge out of the bottom of the bridge and left the car about one-fourth of its normal length. All the impact was on the driver's side, turned up only two minutes after the crash and fully expected it to be a fatality, walked around to the driver's side and somehow he was fully conscious but squeezed into the only space left in the car took almost three hours to get him out. In extracting him out, he had absolutely nothing wrong with him, other than being a pissed up arsehole. Still think, how the F did he survive that? I've seen a photo of a similar situation. Serious accident, multi-car on a highway. When they realized there was a crunched vehicle between two other vehicles, these vehicles were each half their original size from impacts. They assumed the person inside the barely seeable vehicle was liquefied. I don't remember the accident details other than that. But he had been driving a pickup truck. He was alive. He didn't lose any limbs, but had a few minor injuries. The vehicle somehow perfectly wrapped around the driver's seat, giving this man a metal cocoon. Good thing he didn't have any other passengers. There's a picture of this guy in his cocoon, smiling at the camera while waiting for help. Not a doctor, but a friend's story. He'd been feeling like shit for a long time, so he finally went to the doctor. The doctor ordered a bunch of blood tests and ordered them at a rush basis. The lab calls the doctor to bitch him out. Why the F did you make us rush these tests? The doctor is confused. And the lab replied, the guy is clearly dead, so what's the effin' rush? The doctor calls my friend, tells him to not drive, but to get himself to an emergency 
ASAP. The guy was a type 1 diabetic, hadn't realized it until way later in life, and apparently his blood work suggested he was a corpse rather than a living person. He's still doing fine. I'm not a doctor yet, but during one of my night shifts as a medical student, I had to take in charge of a patient who came to the ER for a car accident. You know, well that's quite common. What is not is that he came by himself from 40 kilometers by calling a taxi because his car was absolutely wrecked in the accident. Normally, when your car ends up upside down after two or three rollovers at 60 kilometers per hour, which the patient did, you are not really fine. However, he was totally okay. No broken bones, no head trauma, no abdominal pain, nothing. He just came to the ER because he had a little dermabrasions over his knees and one elbow, and it hurts when it rubs against my clothes. Three band-aids later, he was good to go. I'm a patient. Not as cool as most of these, but I was puking for three days straight before going into urgent care. I wasn't even going to go in, but my family said I looked awful, and I eventually relented. They said I had appendicitis. Due to a mix-up, I didn't get operated on for over a day later. When they went in, my appendix was gangrenous and had basically disintegrated. Turns out it had burst, ruptured, days ago. Normally, this floods your body with toxins and you die. But apparently, my colon was positioned in such a way that it blocked that from happening. I was in the hospital for another week before my digestive system restarted and I had to have a bile pumped out of my stomach. All in all though, not a terrible experience. My intern year doing surgery, a guy gets brought in for a gunshot wound to the head. He was working at a jeweler that got robbed, and his co-worker was black bagged at the scene. He gets brought into the trauma bay, and it's pretty hectic because a gunshot wound to the head, and well, he's alive. Not only is he alive, he's following commands, but not speaking probably from the shock. The cops are giving us reports saying he was likely shot with a 357 snub nose they recovered at the scene. So we do our primary and secondary survey and all this guy has a single wound to his left frontal scalp where the bullet went in. So the team hasn't really seen something like this before. Sure, a gunshot wound to the head wasn't new, but this guy was otherwise completely fine. The decision was made to get a quick frontal and late head x-ray to verify where the bullet was before proceeding to CT. Well, we don't see any bullet on the films. There is no bullet on the board or bed or within the patient's clothes. The man was shot in the head and the bullet bounced off of his skull. CT showed no fracture even. It was wild. Never seen anything like that since. Not a doctor, but a patient. My husband took me to the local hospital's ED for ongoing severe lower abdominal pain. I figured uterus. The nurses took blood, hooked me up to an IV, and gave me a little pain medicine. A nurse I hadn't yet seen came into the ED room looking very nervous and told me I was being admitted as my platelet count was 6,000. My husband and I were like, what? The nurse was very surprised I had no symptoms like bruising, nosebleeds, and blood and urine or stool. He looked very concerned, and the medical team rushed to get me into a room. The only symptoms I had were fatigue and heavy menstrual flow, both symptoms I had been companions since I started my period at 11 years old. The next morning, a hematologist came into my room and explained my diagnosis and that it was entirely idiopathic. He told me I was lucky to not have crazy internal bleeding, bleeding into my brain, or a stroke. He prescribed a regimen of 60 milligrams of prednisone daily, which I was on for a year and a half. Don't recommend. It was awful. The idiopathic thrombocytopenia made no progress. It was finally decided to proceed with a splenectomy. Recovery was brutal. Having a huge incision down the length of your abdomen makes everyday tasks very difficult and painful. Almost five years later, my platelet count is normal. My period can go to hell in a handbasket, though. 
I know someone with a similar story. They measure platelets in a different unit here, I guess, because normal is between 120 and 240. She was tested and came back with three. Doctor said she was lucky not to have sneezed because that would have caused a bleed somewhere and they wouldn't have been able to stop it. Unfortunately, even after years of treatment and a splenectomy, she hasn't been cured. I hope I never effing see this again. I just finished a 24-hour call, so I'll paraphrase. I'm an OBGYN resident. We had a 300-pound African-American female with IVF twins around 32 weeks gestation. She has multiple medical problems. She has chronic hypertension, and she's being monitored inpatient. AMM rounds, she looks uncomfortable, said she slept in a chair, just looked very anxious for no reason. She's breathing really heavy. Her blood pressure is very, very high. We give her medications. We can only get one twin's heart, probably because she's so big. We move her to labor and delivery for closer monitoring, plus ready to access ultrasound. Now, she has a lot of abdominal pain. Her blood pressure is still very high, and her breathing is getting heavier. The stat chest x-ray shows her lungs are like completely whited out, filling with fluid from flash pulmonary edema. At the same time, her abdominal pain is worse and worse. Big, bright red clot is falling out of her vagina. Same time we get an ultrasound view of both fetuses, twins to heart, super slow. Patient is now having a panic attack and screaming while also having trouble breathing. This is all within like 10 minutes. So we do a stat emergency crash C-section. We get her on the table and she starts having an eclamptic seizure. Anesthesia does their rapid sequence incubation. Loud, long, steady, beep. Patient goes into cardiac arrest on the table. Code blue, code blue, labor and delivery goes out overheard throughout the hospital. Phones all over the floor start blowing up, white coats and scrubs sprinting onto the floor. ICU comes running, rapid response team comes running, general surgery comes running, a double NICU team comes running. There's like 30 people in the OR. ICU is giving chest compressions and running the code. Surgery is putting in a central line. Rapid response is setting up to shock. OBGYN is doing the C-section. I remember the attending yell, cut, cut, cut. OBGYN goes into baby number one in about 54 seconds. There's blood everywhere. Compression still going while operating. Second baby comes out very still looking. Placental abruption. The high blood pressure flooded her lungs and tore the placenta off of the uterus. NICU takes both babies. They eventually do just fine as far as hospital course goes. Mom achieves ROSC, return of spontaneous compressions. Her heart is beating on its own now, but she is still bleeding. Massive transfusion protocol initiated. She eventually gets somewhere between 14 to 20 units of packed red blood cells plus plasma, platelets, other stuff. Thank you for giving blood. It actually actively saves the lives of people who wish they could know who to thank. Conservative surgical measures don't stop the bleeding. Cuvillaire uterus is diagnosed secondary to placental abruption in the setting of eclamptic seizure. Cesarean hysterectomy is performed and we get the uterus out. Patient remains intubated for about two days. She's downgraded from the SICU. She walks out of the GD hospital after one week because that's how a solid medical team handles their shit. Now, there were a lot of red flags to indicate delivery at the beginning of the story, but she spiraled so fast. There really wasn't any significant wasted time. Oh my gosh, these stories are so crazy. And that's going to wrap up today's post. Do you have any stories you'd like to add and share? We would love to hear them in the comments below. If you liked the video, please 
leave a like or a comment. It always helps us out a lot. And if you'd like to hear more and see more posts from r slash askreddit and other subreddits when they come out on the channel, please subscribe. As always, thank you so much for watching and for listening.